Can we get a security guard down here, please? You better get ready because this episode of Corpse Factory has full on mental breakdowns. The weekend is here, and despite my desire to stay inside my apartment with the doors locked and windows closed, I find myself at the mall shopping for a new phone charger. My current charger gave up on me at midnight, and now my phone is running dangerously low on power. I tried plugging into different outlets, I tried plugging into my laptop, but nothing I did gave my device even the slightest amount of charge. I thought for sure I had a spare charger lying around, but I turned my apartment inside out trying to find it. Couldn't even find the right type in my drawer of burner phones. So either the charger has died, which is the best case scenario, or my phone has become faulty. I hope the latter is not the case because I really can't afford to purchase a new one. Getting it repaired is out of the question. I refuse to hand it over to somebody for a day or two to go and go without it. So I'm hedging my bets on the issue being with the charger. If I can buy a new one, all my problems should be solved. This is what I tell myself as I scurry through the crowded mall, dodging left and right to avoid careless people trying to bump into me. I know there's an electronic store around here somewhere. Even a discount store will probably have a budget charger that will still fit my device. I just want to find what I'm looking for and get out of this place. As I blindly navigate the area, I think back to last night when I first noticed my phone was no longer charging. I had been browsing through the obituary newsfeed searching desperately for any sign of my latest victim's demise. No clues came up. There were countless new obituaries, of course. This is a big country and people die every day, but very few match the description of my victim. The obituaries that did match had photos included, but none of them looked remotely like the twin woman. It was dead end after dead end. I might have to just accept the fact that this latest request will go unfulfilled. But accepting it makes me angry. Very, very angry. I find myself stomping through the mall more often than simply walking. A few people glance at me, but I don't pay heed. I wanted that woman to die. I wanted her twin sister to rejoice or despair at the fate that befell her own flesh and blood. I wanted her to feel the fear of seeing her own corpse in a photo. I wanted her to feel the cold and clammy hands of death tugging at her skirt, whispering to her, inviting her to spiral down and down and down and down and down. To spiral down and just die. To give up, to die, to spiral down, to die, to spiral out of control. Okay, Noriko, we get it, honey. I wanted her to die. Okay, okay, okay. Oh my god, she's saying it again. And again. Spiral down, down, down. Why didn't you die? Oh, honey. <laughs> Why didn't you die? My head is foggy, my senses blurred, my face hot, my hands cold. I repeat the mantra through gritted teeth. Honey, you're in public. Why didn't you die? Why didn't you die? Why didn't you die? I fall to my knees and scream at the top of my lungs. You are in a mall. Jeez. <laughs> Why didn't you die? Why didn't you fucking die? What the hell? Damn, she's having a full meltdown. Can we get a security guard down here, please? Die, 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 die. die. Is she going to kill somebody? Mom, I'm scared. Oh my god, all these people are witnessing I'll this. Kill her. I'll find her. I'll find her. I'll find her. Noriko. I taste blood in my mouth. My tongue is numb. My teeth chatter. I'll find that twin bitch. Okay. I'll kill her myself. I'll kill her myself. I'll kill her I'll myself. Kill her. I'll kill her! She'll, she's taking the words right out of my mouth. I'll just let her. I'll let her do the talking. All right. That's enough. Yeah. Ooh. A strong hand pulls at my shoulder and my face hits the ground hard. My arms are restrained behind my back and all I can see in my blurry vision is the checkered, tiled floor of the mall. You're coming with me. My limp form is tugged backward and my head lulls to the side. I shut my eyes and let the blackness envelop me. Whoa. Noriko, you need some help, honey. A stinging cold ice pack bites against my cheek and rudely awakens me from my stupor. I don't know where I am. I don't remember why I'm here, but the sudden chill spreading across my face is nice, almost soothing. I realize that somebody, a tall man, is holding the ice pack to my cheek and he motions for me to take hold of it myself. I reach the sluggish hand to grab the ice pack and continue to press it against my skin. The man walks around the chair I'm seated in and stands behind a simple wooden desk to face me. I can me. imagine my surprise when I recognized you. Oh, look who it is! I have a theory that Norco's first victim was this man's wife, but I don't know yet. That's just a theory. Opening my mouth in an attempt to talk causes a dull ache in my jaw. I apologize for treating you so roughly. The only reason I haven't called for the police 
is because I want to give you the opportunity to calm down and explain yourself. This guy, I know him, but from where? Honey, you steal his internet. He's your neighbor. Oh, of course. It took me some time because I'm not used to seeing the security uniform. This is Kinji Ogawa, the very same guy who lives in my apartment building, the nice guy who greets me in the stairwell. The father of a sweet little Momo. Mr. Ogawa? Ah, so you aren't completely out of it. You know, just, just a little completely out of it, you know. Where am I? This is the mall's security office. You caused quite a scene, Nariko. A scene? Hmm. You don't remember. Well, give it some time. I'm sure it'll come back to you. I try to think hard about the circumstances that led me here. I remember something about visiting the mall to buy a phone charger, but I don't think I ever found the store I was looking for. Some kind of anger or fear or something. Some familiar primal emotion got Listen, the better of me. Nariko, I've always thought you were a sweet girl. And Momo looks up to you, you know. Please, tell me that you're just not feeling well. Please tell me the things you were screaming aren't true. The things I was screaming? An image of smiling woman flashes in my mind, a twin woman with beautiful features and lovely hair. The victim, the one who didn't die. That's right, I remember now. I lost my cool, I became so overwhelmed with frustration that she didn't die. I must have broken down and unleashed my anger here, right in the mall. Stupid, 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 stupid. This is all because I went outside. I went somewhere I don't normally go. I'm usually fine about going to the office. It's familiar. The convenience store is fine too. In fact, my whole meticulously planned morning routine rarely bothers me. The shopping mall? What was I thinking? I haven't been keeping up with my medication. Even if I was on top of it, going somewhere out of my comfort zone is always at risk. I need to start regulating my intake, taking a pill or two every other day or when I feel like it isn't going to help me. Thank you, honey. Skipping days at a time and just popping a few in my mouth when I need to leave the house isn't what I'm supposed to be doing. I need to follow the guidelines. I need to keep a strict schedule of when I take what. Damn it, Noriko. I'm supposed to be calm at all times. Stoic, unflinching, Noriko. What the fuck am I doing? Noriko, you still look a bit flustered. Do you want to lie down for a bit before talking to me? No. Okay. Well, do you want to explain what happened? No. Huh. I never took you for a troublemaker. Please, Nariko. I'm begging you. Don't make me call the police. He's working with you, girl. You were screaming about killing somebody. You were... manic. Yeah, honey, you gotta explain that you need to, I don't know, get back on your regular medication? I... I... You can't just act like that in public. <sighs> you scared a hundred people just trying to make their way through the mall. You scared me. A knock at the door causes Kinji to flinch. Ogawa, may I enter? Ah, uh, yes. Please come in, Mr. Fujikawa. The middle door separating the security room from the real world opens with a screech. A broad, intimidating man enters the small room and displaces all the air inside. I feel like I'm going to suffocate. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. She's calm now. Indeed. The man who seems to be some sort of detective looks me up and down with a sour Miss, expression. your name? I don't answer him. I see. Sir, if I may, this is Nariko Kurosawa. She's an acquaintance. Is that so? An acquaintance? Well, that speaks volumes about your personal life, Ogawa. Oh my gosh. Sir. Leave us be. I wish to talk to her. Oh, Nariko, look what you've done. Yes, Mr. Fujikawa. Kenji bows, his grim smile cracking under fear as he exits the room. The detective, or whatever he is, towers over me. He pulls out a badge from inside his jacket and My flashes it at me. My name is Fujikawa. I'm a detective, an investigator, for the Tokyo Metropolitan Police Department. You must understand that we take death threats very seriously in the police force. Huh? Excuse me, but Kenji said he didn't call the police. Kenji? Ah, Ogawa. Well, never mind what he said. I was here already in regards to another case. I happened to witness your little outburst. Ogawa was kind enough to allow me a moment to interview you personally. Right. So, what do you want to talk about? Listen, if I were in your shoes, I'd drop the sardonic act. I have reasonable grounds to arrest you here and now. Dang, Norco. His voice drips with pure venom. This guy isn't joking around. I squirm a little in my seat and remove the cold ice pack from my face. Now, 
Miss Kurosawa, would you please explain to me who you are threatening to kill? A wave of dread washes over me as the reality of my current situation starts to sink in. Honey, yeah. If I don't fly straight and narrow here, I might be in for a world of trouble. I apologize for my actions. I wasn't feeling like myself earlier. I regrettably skipped my medication recently. <laughs> the medication excuse. Well, it is true. I'll play along. Were you hallucinating then? No, sir. Not exactly. I need to come up with something and quickly, or I'm not getting out of here anytime See, soon. I recently had an altercation with a co-worker about a guy we both like. The detective rolls his eyes at me. Go on. I guess I was a little upset about our fight, and really, we're actually quite good friends, so... I think a combination of that and missing my medication caused me to get a little too upset and say some things I don't really mean. Mm-hmm. And how do I know you're not dangerous? Are you carrying any weapons, Miss Kurosawa? Weapons? No, of course not. I see. Well, you're going to have to permit me to search your belongings. You understand that I can't allow you to leave until I have established that you're not a threat, right? The detective lurches forward and roughly grabs my handbag. <laughs> Whoa there, man. Calm down. Hey! He tears it open and rummages around inside. I'm somewhat relieved that I'm traveling lightly today. I even left the two books I'm reading at home. Good. He finds nothing of interest in the bag, save for one thing. My phone. Hmm. Taps the screen, toggles the power button, and smacks the phone against his open palm. Is this broken? I realize that the last drop of battery power must have finally drained. I'm probably lucky for that. If he found certain things on my phone, I might be in trouble. It's not like I keep corpse photos on there. That's what my collection of burner phones is for. But there are certain things that would be incriminating if they fell into his hands. My noise chat log with Kojiro, for starters. And then there are those images of Oi and Tamoe, and that famous singer that had her phone hacked and her private photos uploaded to the net. Oh, Noriko, you're just making so many great decisions, if that was you. Oe knows I have her photos. She's okay with it. Tamoe? Tamoe doesn't know about hers. That would be hard to explain. Oh, she has naked photos of Tomoe. Okay, Noriko. The singer, on the other hand, was part of a big scandal a few months ago. Probably half of Japan has seen her photos. Noriko! Still, I'd rather keep my personal matters completely private. I don't want this asshole looking into my affairs. The battery is dead, sir. Where is your charger, then? I don't have one with me. He grunts and throws the phone to me, and I barely manage to catch it with my brittle, skeletal, clumsy fingers. Wait here. I need to make a call. He leaves the room unceremoniously, and I hear the scraping shriek of a steel deadbolt locking the formidable door up behind him. I breathe out and try to calm my nerves. I look down at the phone in my hand and see my mirror image counterpart peering at me in the black reflection. I don't look as good as I normally do. My makeup is smudged, which is strangely becoming more and more common for me. I think I've gained some weight. My gaunt face seems fuller somehow, and my prominent cheekbones are softer. This girl staring back at me, she's not wholly familiar. Is this Noriko Kurosawa? Is this Corpse Girl? I look like some concoction of myself and some person I don't fully recognize. I don't understand how I could have gained weight. I've been eating less. Maybe the canned coffee I consume religiously contains more calories than I realize. I'll need to cut down immediately. Honey, in the most loving way possible, you need help. This is None of this is healthy love. A sour taste rolls around on my tongue and I swallow it reluctantly. I feel ill at the sight of myself. The steel door swings open and Fujikawa stomps in like an angry toddler. <sighs> well, the precinct claims you don't have a prior record, Miss Kurosawa. That's good news for you, I'm sure. But it's a fucking pain in the ass for me. <laughs> I flinch at his apparent anger and recoil slightly in my chair. You're free to go. However, I remember you. Another incident like this? And I'll have you in for a psychological assessment faster than you can blink. I can do nothing but nod as a wave of relief washes over me. <sighs> get your things and get out of here. Oh, for the love of God, go eat something. <sighs> you look like a starving child. Fujikawa spins on his heel with force and once again leaves me sitting alone. I take a minute to collect my thoughts before picking up my belongings and shoving them into my handbag. As I leave the security office, I spot Kenji standing outside the door. He bows his head meekly. Take care, Noriko. Yeah. 
He doesn't lift his head as I walk away. Oof, that was rough. So much for stoic, unflinching Noriko. Remember stoic, unflinching Noriko? This is her. Weak of flesh and weak of will. Weak, weak, weak. Norco can't control her emotions. Norco can't face the world outside without the help of peppy pink pills. Norco, Norco, Norco. She keeps calling herself that. I keep calling myself that. But I'm more than that. More than her. I'm corpse girl. I'm bigger than the frail body before me. What do my looks matter in the grand scheme of things? What does my ego matter? Oh, honey. I want to be beautiful, thin, gorgeous. Kojiro called me gorgeous. It made me feel good. But that doesn't matter. None of it matters. Corpse Girl matters. She will succeed and the world will continue to spin. I need to gain weight or lose weight. I need to look like Aoi with her small frame and cute features and that bust that's too hard to look away from. I need to look like Tomoe with her fuller figure, her obscene fashion sense and those oddly beautiful eyes that she doesn't deserve. I need to look like Yuriko with her bad haircut terrible piercings, and trashy clothes. I need to look like Mother, who's just like me and Yuriko combined, but with vacant eyes that used to be sparkling and clear, but now just glaze over whenever you try to talk to her. I need to look like Noriko with her dark hair and her intense gaze and her healthy, acceptable frame. I don't need to look like this skeleton, this living corpse. I don't need to look like this physical embodiment of hunger and longing and lust and fear and stress and anxiety and uncertainty and ambition and exhaustion. I curse the mirror and spit on my own reflection. Fuck you! I clench my fists until my nails dig and tear and pierce my flesh, letting blood trickle between my knuckles and drip down to the carpet. I don't want to be you! I'm better than you! I'm better than you! I'm better than you! But I am you. I am Corpse Girl. It's what I always wanted. It's that sense of belonging that I always sought. It's that feeling of home that I reclaimed after a home was lost. After Mother moved and Yuriko got put on ice and after I found this apartment that felt so strange at first. This is who I am. I love your hair. Your eyes. I love you. Don't ever leave me. Don't leave. I raise two fingers to my mouth and kiss them gently, then press them against the mirror. I love you. Don't ever change. Honey, you're losing it. June 7th, Sunday morning. To my absolute delight, I woke up this morning feeling really refreshed. I was worried that my temporary incarceration at the mall would continue to stress me out today. Thankfully, my fears were unfounded. I spent the early morning cleaning up my room. I had to use some elbow grease to get a few specks of blood out of the carpet and to clean a bit of lipstick off my mirror. I even took my medication with a tall glass of water and I didn't skip the pills. I don't like this time. It'll be some time before I feel stable, maybe even a few weeks, but the fact that I'm already taking steps forward has done wonders for my mood. Today's a day to stay inside and work on me. I can't have another incident like yesterday. I can't break down in public and put myself at risk. I can't break down at home again and feed on my insecurities and anxieties. I need to be strong for Corpse Girl, for me. With my room now clean, I decide to spend a little time tidying the rest of my apartment. As I work, I make myself a new mental checklist of commitments, Norco's promise list, if you will. Commitment number one, I'm not going to lose my shit if a victim doesn't meet their demise. Just because that twin woman didn't kill herself doesn't mean I'm a failure. I had three successes before her and I'll have more successes again. I just need to try harder, work harder, refine my methods and keep more moving forward. And I'm not at a dead end yet. I have a trick up my sleeve after all. Kojiro's connection to the morgue may very well be the ace I need to win. Commitment number two, I'm going to improve myself. I won't say that I'll fix myself. I'm not broken, not yet. I'm going to improve. I'll keep up with my medication. I'll keep up with my social life. That means keeping in touch with the few friends I have. Aoi, Shinya, and even Tomoe. I'm going to eat a little more, not much more, because I want to stay slim, but enough to give me more energy, more motivation. I don't want to be weak anymore. Commitment number three, the last one. I'm going to get over Aoi. I love her. I've loved her since high school. In those days, she always stood by me. My insecurities and anxieties never pushed her away. She knew what I was going through, what I still go through, and she could relate to me. She has her own compulsions and anxiety to deal with, so I can't lean on her like I used to. Instead, 
it's my turn to help her out. But I will move on from obsessing over her. She isn't ready for a relationship and she explained all of the reasons why when she rejected me so long ago. Clinging to the hope that one day we'll be together isn't good for my current state. I need to be moving on, moving forward. I need to let go. She is and always will be my dearest friend. I'll always love her, but I will let her remain as simply my friend and I will find someone else to call a lover. This last commitment really makes me feel like a weight has been lifted off my chest. Instead of obsessing over a always spending countless nights lying in bed looking at her photos, thinking about her at odd hours of the day, Instead of all that, I'll be able to move on, even if it takes some time. I'll find someone who wants to be with me. There are plenty of fish in the sea, as they say. I can't say there's anyone particular I have my eyes on just yet. My social circle is pretty limited, after all. Shinya is a guy I'm simply not interested in. There's no spark there, and there never will be. Tomoe, as irritating as I find her, is oddly alluring to me. I don't like her clothes or makeup or the whole aesthetic she has built for herself, but some part of me would kill to spend a passionate night with her. And there's Kojiro, that weird, awkward, strange, alien creature that I just can't wrap my head around. He said I'm gorgeous. He really said that. But he's too weird. I feel like he's the kind of guy that would stalk you and stab you if you ever broke up with him. For now, I can't think of anyone I would seriously pursue, but I'll give it some time. I have all the time in the world. I find myself smiling as I finish tidying up the apartment. Having a nice, clean place to live really does help to lift the spirits. Unfortunately, I still haven't managed to get rid of that lingering scent of mold that always wafts around. It's a musty odor that seems to be ingrained in the very walls of the apartment building for at least as long as I've lived here. I know it's not coming from my apartment because it's pretty easy to smell from downstairs too, and as far as I can tell, my place is completely mold-free. I might not be the best at cleaning, but if nothing else, I keep disgusting mold out of my home. Still, the occasional odor aside, my place is clean and cozy now. I lay down on the couch and stretch my body, letting my taut, Muscles stiffen and then relax. The day is still early and it feels good that all my chores are already complete. The icing on the cake is the fact that Corpse Girl has two new requests sitting patiently in her inbox. I logged in earlier and saw them but decided to sort out my cleaning first. Now I can reward myself by spending the rest of the day working on the new requests. I can hardly contain my excitement at the prospect two requests to work on is better than I could hope for. And I'm sure at least one of these new victims will fall. My positive attitude will go a long way to ensuring my success this time. Unable to restrain myself anymore, I snatch up my laptop from its charging point next to the couch. I flip open the lid and gaze at the photos that I downloaded earlier. My two new victims, fresh blood. The first is an older male, maybe in his 50s, typical businessman type. He might as well be a clone of every other nondescript man you see on the subway, at the supermarket, on TV. If I had to guess, I'd take a leap and say his miserable wife wants him out of the picture. Maybe she's unhappy with her finances, or she's having an affair, or she's just tired of his clone face and his clone personality. Regardless, someone wants this unremarkable man removed from the face of this unremarkable world. The second victim is much, much more interesting. Two things strike me as noteworthy about this photo. Firstly, the cleavage, of course. Secondly, the image is a photograph of a photograph. Somebody has snapped a picture of an actual physical photo and uploaded it to the site. The photograph is in good condition as though its owner values it above all else. A signature is scribbled across it in white ink. It's an autograph photo of someone who is perhaps moderately famous. I don't recognize the woman in question. The signature is such a mess that I can't even make out a single kanji in her name. Regardless, I would be willing to bet that a disgruntled fan is requesting her death. If she's an idol or a singer or an actor, it wouldn't be unheard of for something like this to happen. A fanboy gets to meet her a few times. They shake hands at events, whatever. He asks her out and she politely declines. And then the obsession begins. If the fanboy can't have her, no one can. Kill her. Kill her. Well, that's the theory I slowly piece together as I examine some of the finer details of the photo. The reasons behind the request don't matter. They never matter. I'll kill them all the same. I'm going to work on the woman's photo first. I'll timestamp her photo with tomorrow's date and send it to her this afternoon. That should give her about 24 hours to give up on life and light herself on fire. Maybe I'll do the same with the businessman. I'll give him a timestamp set 24 hours from when I send the photo. It'll be kind of fun to schedule two deaths to occur around the same time. It will make tomorrow a very exciting day. With my goal set, I load up the database of the deceased and get to work.